Let's see. So working in a mastery classroom, what can you expect? Well, first you need to set the mood, right? When you come into my room, it is not facing the, the, the board. Do not expect me to teach because that's not my job. I am here to help you learn. So kids are sitting in groups at their tables. Labs are usually around the outside. Demos are on the outside. And I just wander. So I've got all this empty space. So if I'm just kind of hanging out, kids can feel free to come up, ask me questions. I go to them. In the back, I've got three laptops that are set up there. So if a student needs to use a computer, I've, I've got that provided for them. Uh, kids bring their laptops, they bring their iPods, they bring their iPhones, everything. I mean, if you're sitting there working on your cell phone, doing whatever, watching a video, that's great. You're using it as a tool and you're not being distracted by it. So I'm very, very open about how they direct their learning. As long as they're working, I don't care what they're working on. Um, and now there are some things to be said about, okay, well, what if they're working on an English paper in my class? That, I take that kind of case by case. Um, and I'll, I can talk more about that later, but really the, the important thing is that they are learning in the class, and that's what I'm, I'm shooting for. Um, assignment versus objective-based grading. So uh, a typical, you know, traditional classroom is take this homework, do it, get it back, I grade it on a 10-point scale, and the grade goes in the book. I don't do that anymore because you can copy homework, you can copy, you know, whatever. Uh, so now they have to prove to me that they know it, and I know that they know it, and they know that they know it, and I'll talk about that in another minute. Uh, tracking and managing student progress, that can get a little hairy, and I've, I've got a, a working method. I wish it, 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 would, it was easier, but it works. And then managing the classroom, the asynchronous classroom with you know 15 different things going on. And then how do I know uh, that they're learning? How can I reliably test them? So this is how I started. This was unit one. I had 29 checkpoints for every student for unit one. So out of 90 students, 29, 90 times 30, that's a lot of grading, all right? I mean, and that's just like people handing me papers from every direction, and I scan it to make sure that it looks mostly right. So it's a ton of work for me. It was a headache every day, and I was doing them a disservice because I couldn't really sit and look at everything and say, Did, do you really get this? But really what this breaks down into, each number is one assignment. Um, so... For, you know, number one, they had to just bring me their course descriptions, showing, that, showing me that they had talked to mom and dad at home that my class is going to be very, very different this year than what they're going to be used to. Um, each week, students are given a block of assignments to complete. So in a given week, I would come in on Monday, and I would say, all right, on Friday, I need to see 17 through 23 done. Um, so this one is very much completion-based, and I was still directing what they were doing. I didn't like that. So what I switched to is this objective-based grading, and now this is the one that's going around. So this sheet changes dramatically, it is much shorter, and it's, it's based on a performance objective. So this is where it kind of ties into elementary a little bit, right? So correct me if I'm wrong, but like elementary teachers are saying, all right, handwriting, you know, here's, did you meet my objective? Here are some comments, and you go from math skills, you know, addition, multiplication. I do the same thing, except now it's at a high school level. So to get this checkpoint, they need to come up to me to describe the importance and implications of the kinetic molecular theory of gases. All right? And if they really understand it, they'll be able to say, Mr. Bennett, gases do not interact. Pressure is caused when gas particles hit the wall of a container, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This is the reference. So if they are stuck on number one, where do I go to get help? Well, that's podcast one, and it's my textbook, chapter 5.6. Um, Required activities, for some of them, I do require them to do a little bit extra, and that's where the weight changes. So if they just need to show me something or talk to me about something, it's a low, low weight. And it puts more importance on studying for the quizzes and studying for the labs. So I'm still directing their learning by saying you have to do these couple things, but it's not a list of 29 different things they have to do now. Now it's like six. Um, I also give them important vocabulary at the bottom. So these are like the seven big ideas, or eight big ideas. Notice I've got eight big ideas down here, eight podcasts, one per podcast. Um, so really what they do when they come in, in a given week, I will say you need to do three objectives. So if in one week they got one and two done, then the next one, well, they're on three through five. Let's say some student is particularly bright in chemistry. They got one through five done the first week. Now they're working on the last three. The thing is that they're self-pacing. I set a base, what I think would be a, a, uh, a steady pace to say, all right, this unit shouldn't take more than three weeks. I'll just break it into three-week chunks. And most kids work at that pace. Some work ahead. Others can work a little slower. But because of the class, I'm not teaching directly to everyone all the time. I can work with the kids who are slower. The kids who are working faster can help the kids in the middle, and everybody's covered. 
and I still know exactly where anyone is at any one time. Let's see. So whenever you walk into my room, you're going to see me carrying this clipboard around. So I've got all my objectives across the top. They're quiz grades and then participation grade just to keep them on task, really. Uh, flexibility is key. We want to make sure that these kids feel like they have the option to direct what they're doing. Um, I remember in high school chemistry, I hated chemistry. I don't know why I'm teaching it. I really did not like it in high school because my teacher was driving us and I didn't under, ever understand it and I just fell behind and felt crushed. But under this, they have a hard time with number three. They can't get the lab done. No problem. Do it next week. We'll talk about it. We'll take some more time and work on it. So very, very flexible. And it's very, very different than, than what I did last year. So looking at assignment-based versus objective-based, while assignment-based is very completion and practice-heavy, it's still I'm still defining what they're doing. And it's very busy work. So like, a kid gets an idea, but he still has to do three worksheets on it. You know, it's just, oh, come on, Mr. Ben, why do I have to be doing this? And I thought about it. I said, I don't know. Why do you have to do it? Well, it's because I say you have to do it. So when you switch to objective-based, now I'm looking at a skill set. If you have this skill set built, you, you know it now. Um, practice is varied. So I give them all these questions to do. They do two of them. If they get it, they get it. I don't require you to do any more because I'm not checking your assignment anymore. I'm checking the skill. It's very student-defined. So again, the bright kids can work ahead very quickly, they, or they can slow down and work with other people, or they can study at their own pace, and then there's no more busy work because you're only doing what you feel like you need to do now. So objective base is, is great. It does take a lot of work, though, and that's, that's one thing that is a little daunting when you're thinking about starting this. Both of them, though, they're, you're building their study skills because they need to make sure that they're pacing themselves. Uh, students this year have told me they really feel like they understand it and they know it. Um, and I didn't get that as much last year. And then time management. So uh, I've got a soccer game on Wednesday. Well, I've already got my videos uploaded. Kids have already talked to me if they're going to miss class. You know, like they're they're just they're learning how to be independent learners. Uh, tracking progress. So this is the clipboard. This is my teacher checklist. So every unit. Uh, let's see. This is from like unit three or four. But every unit, I've got my list of objectives and a brief description. So if they get this one checked off, they have to show me that they understand what the charges of ions are. Um, and I don't remember exactly what I did for that. But pretty much, um, each student is individually tracked for every day of the year. So for um, we're on unit six now. I've got five other staple packets with every kid's name, every checkpoint that they got, notes off to the side. So if they turn in late work, if they miss the test, if I email mom and dad, it's all right here, hard copy, and I can back myself up when mom and dad come in and say, how come he's got a zero for these three assignments? I can say, well, you get them done. Um, color coding is really important for me because I, I just pick out different colors very quickly. It's easy to point to a student, so they say, why do I have a zero? And I say, well, look, it's in red. That means you didn't get it turned in that week, so now it's late. Um, and then notice observations communication is also recorded on the side. So uh, in a typical unit, this is what one would look like. So uh, let's see. Let me bring it in. Okay. So red is a late assignment. It's a little dark up here. I apologize for that. But red means that I did not see it by the day I set. So this is going at my pace, saying you need to get these three things done. So th this kid's not doing so hot. Right? Lots and lots of red. The, the difference in this, though, is usually if, it's, if an assignment is late, you say, Psh, Mr. Chance, I still want it. They do not get off that easy. So red means that it's late, and I can see patterns. So at student teacher conference or student parent conferences, I bring this out and say, look, your son turned in one assignment on time over the last three weeks. There's a problem here. And mom and dad say, ooh, yeah, let's fix this. Um, and it's not just me versus the kid. We've got hard evidence now. Um, Let's see, I always mark the date my grades go into the grade book or when something is due. So this first week or this second week or whatever, I finish my grades on September 17th. They're in the book, they're done, and I know that they're done now. So when a student says, Mr. Bennett, uh, this one's red, but it was really on time, I say, well, no, I finished this last week. I know it's not. Okay, so it, it eliminates the chance of, of kids getting an edge by working on the fact that I have 90 students. And I can't remember what everyone did, but my paper remains. Um, and then student communication. So I take notes. So um, I email mom and dad on this day. I follow up on this day. Get a response back this day. Talk to Brian. Talk to Seth. Talk to whoever I need to. Uh, but really, this is to make sure that I'm doing my job well. 
also. And if you're thinking about doing this, you really should have something hard copy, not electronic, because electronic can get changed really quickly. Hard copy, I actually have to go to physically, cross it out, write it in, circle it, highlight it, whatever. So, are there any questions? I've talked a lot. Okay. <laughs> Uh, evidence of learning. Well, I talk to every student every day. Uh, so one-on-one -on -one discussion, I can come up and say, hey, what are you working on? Oh, I'm working on this. Well, do you really understand what this means? Can you show me? Show me some work, yada, yada, yada. I talk to them. Intentional directed questioning. I know what I'm looking for. They don't always know what I'm looking for. So if a kid is, is like, hey, what the heck should I be doing? I can sit down with them side to side and say, this is what I'm looking for in this particular thing. And the important part is that I'm taking time to do it. It's an intentional motion. It's an intentional movement. Um, it's really easy on some days if I'm feeling tired. I teach fourth block every day. So <coughs> just at the end of the day, I'm just like, oh, man, I don't want to do this again. And it's easy just to sit down and not worry about stuff because they're all working. That's, that's a bad, bad habit to get into. You have to be intentional about this in order to get it to work. Um, group work and peer tutoring. So let's, let's say a group of students or I'm getting multiple questions about a particular topic. I can take all these kids, set them aside, and I'll work with them as a group instead of one-to-one. -one. Um, so just really good management, right? you know, and just building the management skills. But a formative, formative assessment is paramount. Every day, these checkpoints are all formative, right? Um, they do go into the grade book as a number grade, but the fact is I'm still checking it every day and I can fix problems on the spot. They still take a test at the end of the chapter and that serves as the summative, but the, the big thing with this is that I can take a misconception instead of seeing it on an exam, I see it the day it happens and I can fix it the day it happens so they don't miss it on the exam or they shouldn't miss it on the exam. They still do. Um, the hardest thing about this, I would say, beyond the work that goes in to build it, is the summative assessments, writing the tests. And that's because right now there's not a great tool for that. Uh, you know, the whole point of this is immediate feedback. So talking to kids, uh, if Jim says something that is wrong, I can fix it immediately, that immediate feedback component. I want to do that same thing on an, on an exam. Um, and I need to write questions that are content-based but also skill-based. So they have to really understand the vocabulary in order to do what I'm asking them to do. And that's very difficult to do. It's really not easy. And I made a lot of mistakes as I've been working through this. Um, so right now I'm using Class Marker. It's okay, not great. They do get feedback on multiple choice. Their scores are saved. So if they take a test three or four times or whatever, I see every test. So if their progress goes up, that's good. They're fixing mistakes. But if it's kind of staying the same or fluctuating, I can pull them aside and say, we need to figure out what's going on. The problem with this, though, is that if you have exam view, it does not import questions. So you have to sit and type every one out, which takes so much time. Uh, and it's clunky. It's There's like. You have to use like codes, like you can't click a button and get superscript if you want superscript. You can't, it, like it doesn't do that for you. So it's functional, but I really don't like it. And that's why I want Moodle, because Moodle does all that for you. Um, and for class marker, if you do like calculation or word questions, typing out answers, you have to grade those yourself. Um, so it, again, it's functional, it serves its purpose, it does make random tests for me. So I build question banks for every unit that have 80 or 90 100 questions or so, when they sit down to take the test, they get a new test every time. And so they can they can continually try and try and try. And I require them to get a 75% before they can move on to the next unit. So that's one thing that's good about it is that they can come in and do it. The other thing that's good about it is that tests are closed unless I open them. So I open a class when they're in my room. So they're not at home going through their notes and taking tests and things like that. But still not great, but it works. And with objective-based Grading, though, I'm more than okay with kids, okay, they're taking a writing test. That's fine. Um, the last unit was particularly difficult for a few students. I gave them oral exams, and that was great because they know it, and they know they know it because they can talk about it. So I have the flexibility to give them an oral exam to really still make sure that they get it, and they're not being um, discouraged just because of the nature of the class. So again, differentiation is really good. But some kids said, hey, I want to design a project that showcases this. This is how I'm going to do it. This is what I'm going to do. And this is what you can expect. And I'll say, great. And I'll grade it based on what they give me. And you know, I do hold them to a certain expectation, so they can't turn in junk. But they still have the freedom to show me what they learned with their skills. Um, some kids like to write. Some kids like to do narratives. I haven't had anyone do a narrative yet. I want one. But 
you know, it, the flexibility is there because it's not a traditional setting where they come in and take tests. If they want, if they like written tests, awesome. If they don't, let's figure out what's what you're going to do well at, but still showing me what I want to see. 